I want to do now uh, is touch on this subject briefly, uh, sexual offending behaviour, because what, what often is believed that if a male is sexually abused, then he's likely to become a perpetrator. And, um, and that's probably not true in a sense. Um, it's um, probably out of 100% of males that are abused, probably only likely 5, maybe 10% of that population would become offenders. So it's quite small. Uh, in, in but the way the media portrays it, it would seem quite large. And so what we're going to do, we're just going to talk about it. Uh, I'm nowhere near a forensic expert to talk about sexual offending behaviour, so any questions relating to a paraphilia, which is often it's referred to, is probably best directed at someone who actually works with sexual offending behaviours. But I'll do my best to bring, a, bring some awareness around this topic, um, and then we'll take it from there. So there's a distinct difference between adolescent and male female sexual offending behaviour. The following is a very brief overview because it's such a complex and you know, you know clinical sort of approach to it. Adolescent female sexual abusers are quite rare, and the research is relatively new in how to identify and treat adolescent female sex offenders. So, out of 100% of the crime around the world, um, women make up about 10% of all crime globally. And so sexual offending females are around the 1% maybe even. So they're quite rare and, they, and we're only just starting to understand what that's about. Uh, there's also a contradictory research and contention on the subject. So it's not worth going into the research because like, there's all over shots and different points of view. So we're just still waiting on some concrete research and longitude um, studies on, on the area. Matthew Matthews and Speltz as Simon and Kuhn and profile adolescent adult female abusers in these three distinct ca categories. Teacher lover who is usually involved with the adolescent or pre-boys, they want to teach them about sex. So we've had some teachers in, in news that have had sex with teenage boys and being adult teachers, so that's where they fit in that profile. Male coerced offenders who initially abuse in conjunction with a male may be later abused independently. This type of abuse is extremely dependent and non-assertive. Predisposed offender who has been sexually abused themselves from a very young age, they initiate the abuse themselves and usually abuse their own children. Their intention appears to be non-threatening emotional intimacy. So they're the three categories. Further to the profile of Matthew Matthews, 1993 study of 36 women as cited in Kuhn explains the following. Like male offenders, women offenders will come from chaotic, abusive backgrounds feel they do not belong with and have low status among their peers. They are often friendless and will do most anything for acceptance. Exception in relation to male offenders is that women offenders do not involve or coerce anyone else to offend. So they do in isolation rather than form partnerships or gang rapes or packs and things like that. They use force or violence less frequency so it's not, they, they're not into violence a whole lot. And that's probably linked to more nurturing elements to, to the female side. The research found to be a lesser degree threaten their victims to remain silent, so they're not likely to threaten them to do that, like men would. There's a mixed information around the issue of denial. One example we found women more likely to admit offending and take some responsibility. A McCary, as cited in Matthews, revealed that because if the nurturing and caring role and the importance of women may place on it, denial was found to be greater. Hang on. Uh, yeah, found to be greater. Male offenders will offend at an early age. However, out of 36 women that participated in the research, only two offended in their adolescence. So often you'll find boys and adolescent males tend to be offended, uh, offending and aggressive, and then they pack that into adult life, where women tend to be more adult like or in their young adults, adult life, when they offend. So it's quite an interesting statistic, but still very small, 36. It's quite a small study. Figures from New South Wales on initial presentation of sexual assault services indicated that in 1995-96, a male child under the age of 16 was the assailant in 16.2% of cases of child sex assault. Male adults who are known to the victim are the most common assailants in the case of sex assaults in New South Wales. So that's a key indicator to profiling is that the stranger danger message is a really good message, one that should not be avoided, but often sexual abuse is often the victim is known to the perpetrator. So they're a coach, 
a mentor, um, a friend of the family, an uncle, relative, or a parent. So that's how Denley works profiling in that sense. For three out of the, of the last four reporting years, however, the second most common assailant for girls was a male child under the age of 16. Similarly, in recent reporting years, the second most common assailant for boys was a male child under the age of 16. When a male child under the age of 16 was the most common assailant in 27.1% of the cases. So quite a startling statistic. And they're not, up, not recent statistics, but it just gives you an idea of the prevalency there. Overwhelming 99% of the person in prison for sex offences are male. The highest rate of imprisonment for sex offences is for those between the ages of 40 and 44. A little over three quarters of all prisoners uh, fell in the 20 to 55 age range. The following table classifies sexual behaviour of young people into age appropriate concerning very concerning categories. So 8 to 12, pre-adolescent, age appropriate sexual behaviours. So occasional masturbation, show me your, show me mine, my fears. Now, that occasional masturbation is at the higher end. It's not necessarily at the lower end because these years boys are entering puberty earlier, so you know, 12, 13, it's probably more acceptable, but definitely not at the lower end. Show me mine, show me yours with peers is, is okay. Um, kissing and flirting, genital or reproduction conversation with peers, dirty words or jokes with peer groups. So that's appropriate. So that's a parameter. Anything outside of that parameter, like I had, oh, I'm an eight year old and I'm, I'm saying to you that I had sex, you got a like, little red flag goes up, or I'm doing this, or I, you know, watched daddy, um, you know, watched dad's porn on the internet and then I went and did it to my little brother or something. It, 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 these are little red flags that should go up. We follow the normal parameters here. Concerning sexual behaviours, so attempting to expose others' genitals. Uh, sexual knowledge too great for their age once context is considered. Preoccupation with masturbation. Uh, single occurrence with peeping, exposing, obscenities, pornographic interests. Sources include the internet, pay TV videos, DVDs and magazines. Stimulating foreplay or intercourse with peers with clothes on. So these are really concerning behaviours. And so if you've got any cases of young people that you're working with or you're aware of some stuff, you know, maybe it's a chat with your supervisor and say, a little red flag, hey, I did this, this is what I'm thinking. Very concerning sexual behaviours. Compulsive masturbation, including task interruptions to masturbate. Repeated or chronic pain, exposing your obscenities. Chronic uh, pornographic interest, child pornography sources include internet, pay TV, etc. Degradation or humiliation of self using sexual themes. Degradation or humiliation of others using sexual sex sexual themes, touching genitals of others without permission, sexually explicit threats, written or verbal, forced exposure of others' genitals, simulating intercourse with peers with clothes off, penetration of dolls, children or animals. So these are, so they're the parameters. So if you're getting any of this sort of stuff coming through, red flag goes up, take notes, chat with your supervisor, discuss a course of action, what do we need to do, is the best thing. And, uh, and, and a little, little thing here is that we don't make decisions in isolations in regards to most cases, but in particular with this sort of stuff. We want to be in consultation regularly with our supervisors or if we're counsellors with our um, you know, clinical supervisors, all that sort of stuff, youth workers, your coordinators or your seniors, whoever, but we don't make these decisions in isolation. We just take notes, we give a story, we do some work, then we go away and discuss it and maybe something else needs to occur. So 13 to 18 year olds, so age appropriate, sexually explicit conversation peers, yep, we get it. Obscenities with jokes with, within the cultural norm, yep, we get it, the old fart joke, all that sort of stuff. Sexual innuendo and flirting, it's all part of that growing up, look at me, I'm gorgeous. Uh, solitary masturbation, yeah, you know, that's still part of exploring one's body. Kissing, hugging, holding hands, very normal, foreplay, mutual, that sounds very healthy and, you know, later on about the 16th and 18th, yeah, maybe some sexual intercourse at the end of the scale might be occur, but if it happens at 13, I'll be red flagged up and say, well, what's that about? Why are you suddenly now sexually active? You're not supposed to be. You've got to understand that the, uh, the cutoff points um, for, sex, uh, for adolescents to be sexually active is 16 over here in Western Australia. I'm not sure what it's like over East, but any sexual activity under, like 15 and under, is considered a concern and uh, it falls under the Mandatory Reporting Act. So whether the young person's consensual or not, 
we have to do something about it because it's not appropriate. That's guidelines we work with over here anyway. So concerning sexual behaviour, sexual preoccupation or anxiety, pornographic interests, promiscuity, verbal sexually aggressive themes or obscenities, invasions of other body spaces. So touching of genitals, breasts, bum, all that sort of stuff, probably not okay. In fact, it is not okay. So, so very concerning sexual behaviours, compulsive masturbation, uh, especially chronic or public. So if you've got a young person doing it in public, there's, there's obviously concerns. Degradation or humiliation of both self and others using sexual themes or self chronic preoccupation with sexually aggressive pornography, attempting to expose others' genitals, touching other genitals without permission, express, sexually explicit threats, obscene phone calls, exhibition, um, voyeurism, sexual harassment, sexual contact with significantly younger people, sexual contact with animals, and false penetration. So some of it's a bit, uh, but you know, red flag. So again, when you've got something like this happening and you're talking to somebody, um, the idea is that we listen to the story, we hear what they have to say, you know, be a bit challenging, but you know, say look, that might be a bit inappropriate, but you've got to raise these things with our supervisor and say, look, I've got this case, this is what happened in session, and this is what they talked about. Red flag, what do you think we need to do with this? What's some guides, what's some guidelines here? There are no casual factors in regards to adolescent sexual abusing others. There are four dominant risk factors which stand out in the cases that come to attention and these are being a witness to or being directly exposed to family violence. So that's a precursor. Chronic long-term neglect, cumulative harm, inappropriate witnessing of sexual activity. So walking in on mum and dad doing the nasty is, you know, it's just one of those things. But being forced to watch, there's a difference. So being constantly exposed, forced, even watching pornography on TV and all that, or leave the room, you have to stay and watch this or something is not okay, especially if they're young or any any case, um, being a victim of sexual abuse themselves. So anything that's high risk, it's going to put high risk factors in place for the young people. We, um, we need to start saying that this is not okay and start working on how we're going to resolve this. In the past, the influence of adult principles about sexual offending theory, power and domination were considered to be primary reasons for young people sexually abusing others. The research and treatment field now recognises that these behaviours are more complex and multifaceted. It is now generally accepted that there are a number of pathways to undertaking sexually abusive behaviours. There are four potential pathways along which an adolescent sexually abusive behaviour may be shaped. The experience of sexual activity as the primary goal of the behaviour, with violence and aggression being the means to the end of the behaviour. Aggression and violence as the primary aim of behaviours with sexually abusive behaviours secondary to broader contact disorder behaviour. Experimentation, exploration with somewhat naive understanding of the larger consequences. So again, they might not fully comprehend that you can't have sex under the, under the age of 15, but they might have done it just out of curiosity, but not fully understanding that you know they're going to they get in trouble with the law, possibly end up on the sex offenders register and all that sort of stuff. So maybe some. Um, psychoeducation works really, really important with young people around these sort of practices that you know, just need to be aware. Mental, mental illness or cognitive impairment that may result in the young person having a little understanding of appropriateness or consequences of their action. Okay, adolescents with sexually abusive behaviours in the family resource, so there's a link there. Um, that, I'm sure that link will be available, so I'm sure Steve will make that available to people if they're interested, but it's just with the Victorian government website. So. Health yeah, I've got all the references for tonight. So uh, if anyone needs them, they can they can email me. The my email address will be uh, during the question and answer time at the on the last Brilliant. slide. Brilliant. All right.